song let's uh i'd like to uh sing mr uh daniel uh happy birthday <laughs> saw it in here and we have uh lydia and luca big man still i had to ask what key but we need to sing also to jeff because he joined a whole new decade recently, and I am so excited. Yeah, she's been in that decade for a little while now already. The big 60 this week. <laughs> Have you turned 60 yet, Dan? Have you been 60 yet? <laughs> Not yet? Don't ask. So I think we have another song. You do. <laughs> Moving right along. Nothing to see here. Thank you. 
70. Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Hey, we're here. We send a warm welcome to you this morning. We're so glad you chose to worship. We listen and trust. As you do worship, we should draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and closer to us as a community of faith, a church family. Just one big announcement in here today to remind me, which I'm so glad to give or maybe you can make it if you want. All right, a congregational meeting next Sunday right after worship. Uh, there will be a meeting with all our reports uh, for the year 2020. Shouldn't take too long. We know it's on Valentine's Day, but we forgot to say it a few weeks ago. and. We were set it in the last few weeks. So we have to give you two weeks notice. So next Sunday, right after service, congregational meeting. Other than that, I think all our announcements are in the bulletin. So let's all stand for our call to worship. <laughs> Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy has given his Son to die for us, <coughs> and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
one in first reading was from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 21 through 31. People of Judah have been carted off to Babylon. They've been there close to 70 years. And this is what Isaiah has to say to them in chapter 40, verses 21 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of the world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. The creator of the ends of the earth, he will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Here ends the first one. And the gospel this morning is from Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. Hear the word of the Lord. As soon as they left the synagogue, that was uh, James and John and Simon and Andrew, uh, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. Peter left her. <coughs> She began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks. Yeah,
We wonder where is God in all of this? Does he care at all about us, his people? The people of Judah had been taken captive by the Babylonians and didn't know when their exile would end. But here in Isaiah 40, 21 through 31, the prophet tells them that their deliverance is close by. But due to their exile, the people of Judah's concept of God became distorted. And Isaiah attempted to write that perception. When the Babylonians defeated Judah and carted them to Babylon, many of the Jews believed the gods of Babylon were more powerful than Yahweh, the God of Israel. And after seven years in captivity, that perception of God remained. Now, we are not in con captivity as they were, but last year it felt like we were in captivity, but only to a pandemic. All of us have made major adjustments, and if you're like me, you're sick of masks, social distancing, and disinfectant. But as M. Scott Peck reminds us in his wonderful book, The Road Less Traveled, the classic, life is difficult, life is hard. Unfortunately, we never think it should be. We think God should prevent us from having difficulties because we are faithful to him. But he never promised to keep difficulties from us. He promised to be there with us in the midst of them. The exile's perception of the Lord and ours in the midst of suffering can get blurry at times. Their God was too small, and Isaiah attempts to change that. What about you and me this morning? Is our God too small? Do we think that his arm is too short, as Abraham tells us in Genesis? Isaiah addresses this in verses 21 through 26. There he says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from when the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift <coughs> up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. The answer, of course, is that they have heard, that they've forgotten that God is sovereign, that he has no equal. <coughs> Although Satan certainly tried to make himself equal to God or greater than God, and Adam and Eve, and we do at times as well. But no one is his equal. For sure, the Babylonian gods were not. And if he knows every star by name, and none of them are missing, those in captivity and us are not missing from God's radar either. Also notice in our gospel passage, Mark 1, 29 through 39, how Jesus cared about people. He went to Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house, healed her of a fever. One touch from Jesus, and she was healed. Verse 31 tells us Jesus came and took her by the hand, lifted her up, and her fever left her, and she began to serve them. Mark was on to tell us that evening they brought all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and Jesus healed many who were sick with various demons and various illnesses, and cast out many demons. But he didn't heal everyone or cast demons out of everyone they brought to him. You may ask, why didn't he? Why didn't he? That wasn't his purpose for coming. He came to die in our place to pay the penalty for our sins so that we might be forgiven for all eternity by faith in him and him alone. After he healed my Peter's mother-in-law, the sick and those oppressed by demons, we read that Jesus rose early in the morning and went to a desolate area. There he prayed. Now I have to ask, why did he need to pray? Have you thought about that? He's God man. I think from being fully man, he needed to stay connected to his father. And we need to stay connected as well. In fact, Martin Luther said this about prayer. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Timothy Chester, in his book, The Message of Prayer, states that prayer is that for which we were made. Wow. He goes on to say, a Christian is someone who knows God through Jesus Christ, and to know God is to converse with him. You ever wonder why prayer is so difficult? 
Why every time you try to pray, the dogs bark, the kids cry, the phone rings, and a jet flies over your house? <laughs> Distracting, is it not? But Jesus needed to stay connected to his Father, and we need to as well through prayer. So why don't we pray more than we do? I ask that of myself. A journalist was assigned to the Jerusalem Bureau of his newspaper. He got in the park and overlooking the Wailing Wall. Anybody been to the Wailing Wall? <clears throat> yeah, there's stuff, little papers in all the cracks of the Wailing Wall with the prayer request. And the Wailing Wall was facing towards the east. You pray, you stuff those papers in to the east. Why? Because Messiah is coming from the east. Right? And so this journalist saw this man every day praying. And he said, what are you praying for? The old man replies, replies, in the morning I pray for world peace. Then I pray for the brotherhood of man. I go home and have a glass of tea. Come back to the wall to pray for the eradication of illness and disease from the earth. The journalist is taken by the old man's persistence and sincerity. You need to be coming to the wall to pray every day for these things. The old man nods. How long have you been coming to the wall to pray for these things? Maybe 20, 25 years. The amazed journalist finally asked, How does it feel to come and pray every day for over 20 years for these things? How does it feel? The old man replies, Feels like I'm talking to a wall. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all feel that way sometimes? We pray, amen. I heard it. Yeah. Do we, don't we wonder what it takes to get the Lord to answer our prayers? Getting the Lord to respond to my prayers reminds me of opening my locker in high school. I had one of those locks that you spun around to different numbers. Anybody had those besides me? <laughs> Anyone remember this? Uh, 22 to the right, then past zero twice, then back to 11, back to zero. Oh my goodness, it won't open. <laughs> and I'm late for class. And Father Murray could hit me with a right hook if I'm late, that's for sure. Because <laughs> he sure nailed Thomas Agnew that one day, and I'll never forget that. <laughs> Many of us feel like I did when I was in a hurry, needed something desperately for my locker, and in an OCD kind of way, I go, did I pass you over once or twice? Well, you can pass it again, right? I thank God those days are behind me. But sometimes I view prayer that way. Maybe you do too. Unless I get my numbers in line with God's numbers, there's no chance of God opening his locker and answering my prayers. And if we can't get the prayer code numbers lined up, eventually most of us will give up, walk away from his locker, and try to solve the problem ourselves. Because even <laughs> though it isn't in the Bible, we still believe God helps those who help themselves. Not true. Not in God's word. Not even in the apocrypha. At times I think we're like the exiles mentioned in Isaiah 40, 27, who thought their way was hidden from the Lord and that they didn't matter to him. Isaiah reminds them, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of heaven and earth. He does not grow weary or faint. His understanding is unsearchable. Again, they have known. They have simply forgotten who God is. You and I have forgotten who God is, that he never sleeps, that he never slumbers, that he wants to act on our behalf for our good and his glory. The Jews are about to be rescued, but just because they can't see him working doesn't mean he's left them high and dry. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Isaiah tells the exiles that the Lord gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, and the Amplified says, those who wait for the Lord, who expect, who look for and hope in Him, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Are you and I getting spiritually exhausted this morning? It's been, it's not old, hasn't it? It's still the Have you not known? Have you not heard? is the sovereign Lord who sits above the circle of the earth, who is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, who does not grow weary or faint, whose understanding no one can fathom. Is our God too small? But how do we hope on him, in him, or wait on him, as other translations read? 
We hope we can stay connected, I believe, through prayer. Jesus encouraged the disciples of Luke 18 always to pray and not lose heart. Prayer shows that we have hope in God, that he's still involved and actively working. Maybe we just confess this morning, we don't pray enough. But we do lose heart. And ask the Lord to forgive our hopelessness. And we ask him to help us to hope in him and wait on him. But we not lose hope and remember who he is and how important we are to him. And remember that he's not forgotten. He has forgotten our sins and his beliefs. <coughs> but he's not forgotten us. And remember that as believers in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us even when we don't know what to pray. And that the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those like you and me who are called according to his purpose. N.T. Wright, in his wonderful book, Small Faith, Great God, says when we look at the true God and wait on him, we find that when there is not enough to be done, we can do it with eagle's wings. When there is running to be done, we can do it without weariness. And when there is walking to be done, we can do it without fainting. May we pray always and not lose heart. And all God's people say.
just sang it out by saying the Apostles' Creed together. <coughs> I believe in God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who lives and lives in the heart of the Holy Spirit, and one of the Virgin Mary. He suffered in the conscious fire, was crucified and died in the grave. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. <coughs> Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. The Lord be with you. And also, we lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God praise and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to his holy name. And with the saints on earth and the hosts in heaven, join in their unending hymn.
I've been set free I've been set free
blood of Christ shed for the remission of our sins. Oh, 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 oh,
Oh, there's 